welcome to Confetti Industry Week. Um, and this is your session with MJ Widenska, who's going to be talking to you about how to build a community, um, especially for indie game developers. Uh, MJ is the founder of Yours Truly, who are an award-winning ethical agency connecting brands in the gaming industry with new audiences. And the companies work with some gaming giants like Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons. Um, please feel free to use the chat functions to ask any questions. We'll aim to answer them um, as we go through. And we hope you'll enjoy today's session. A huge thank you to MJ Widemsker for taking time out today to join us. And that's for our 15th Confetti Industry Week. Uh, don't forget that you can still book onto upcoming events by going to iw.confetti.ac.uk. Make sure you sign up using your confetti or NTU email, not your personal email. Um, as part of Industry Week, we're also running a competition where you can uh, win some really cool prizes. Uh, all you have to do is tag us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag IW21 and sharing your experiences throughout the week. Um, so now I'm going to hand you over to MJ. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm not sure if everyone can see me yet. Um, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Amelia. I'm going to share my screen. Um, just bear with me for one second. And there we go. So as, um, as Amelia has said, I am the creative director and founder of Yours Truly. And we are a award-winning ethical creative studio based in London. So what that means is we have a slightly different approach to how we kind of go about games marketing and that approach is kind of, um, you know, in inspired by my own experience as a woman who has been playing video games since I was a little kid and I would never kind of see myself in those spaces. And then by talking to other, you know, women my age throughout basically my entire, my entire life, I would find out that women do play games, but they're not just kind of, um, they don't feel like they are free to talk about it and engage in this hobby as much as men are expected to. And I think there's a lot of, there's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to kind of um, greater equality within the gaming industry. But we want to do our part by, you know, working with companies that understand this and that want to see kind of greater equality across marginalized backgrounds and genders. Uh, in gaming marketing. So what this talk is going to be about is building communities. And this is going to focus on kind of building communities for indie developers, but it will also work uh, for anyone who is thinking of building a community for a brand or for themselves as a creator. It will, the, the talk will be sometimes vague and sometimes very specific when it comes to games. But um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, throughout, I'll basically keep an eye on the chat throughout the um, duration of the talk. And if there's anything that's kind of relevant to what I'm saying right now, I'm gonna try to kind of answer the questions ASAP, but any other questions, I'm gonna stay online after the talk is done and then I, I can kind of uh, take a and a So um, without further ado, um, yeah, building online communities. So here's why I believe building communities are Great timing, I'm so sorry. Um, here's why I believe building communities works best. And it is because um, it's really sustainable for both small businesses and for creators. And it works better for small businesses and small creators and small games than it does for large ones. So it is one of the most kind of unique ways you can go about your marketing strategy where you actually have a competitive edge over people who are able to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds on their advertising. Because what really matters with communities is kind of honesty and, you know, being able to relate to the person running the community or the brand that's kind of the, in the center of, of the community. So it is very cost effective because with enough resources and time, you could really, um, you could basically run a community or kind of manage a community for free. And anyone who's in a Discord channel or any Discord communities will see that you can truly create, you know, sustainable, big, engaged communities for a creator, for example, for literally only kind of the price of your time. Um, so yeah, so that's pretty great. And it is very effective because what communities do is 
kind of give you a sense of belonging and give you, you know, friends and people to engage, engage and interact with, which means that you feel like this is a far bigger part of your life than seeing an ad, for example. And then um, it is super useful because it helps small studios diversify their income so they don't have to rely as much as investors who would, you know, impose deadlines on you. And it is, I'm going to, I'm going to go through a couple of examples of that. Obviously, Kickstarters kind of are built on communities supporting creators. I'm not going to go into that much detail when it comes to Kickstarters, but it is something to keep in mind that sm small communities, sorry, communities for small studios or for independent game makers can really be, you know, life changing for for the development of, the, of said game. So, and then again, brand loyalty and a sense of belonging. I have covered this. Brand loyalty is a term which you will probably see if you wanna work in marketing, you'll probably see a lot. And that basically means um, which brand do you prefer? But with communities, it brand loyalty is kind of taken on another level just because of that kind of sense of belonging. You feel like, it, if there is a community for a small indie game, it doesn't feel like a brand, it feels like your community and it is. So it's a completely kind of different story to just, you know, preferring one brand of tea over another. And then of course, your community will organically spread the word about your game, which is again, extremely useful. And it is something that um, apparently, I don't know if that's still true, but years ago I've learned about that, um, the most effective way to do marketing is like um, just basically hearing about something from friends and family. So like referrals basically. So yeah, it's probably still the most effective way. So yeah, so that's what your community is going to do for you. So I'm gonna go through two, um, two success stories, two case studies. One of them is Fall Gaze and the other one is Paralife. So Fall Gaze, I'm sure everyone knows. And the thing is, of course, Fall Gaze is a great game and it's super fun. Um, but Fall Gaze also um, is a game that released with a set amount of um, levels. And basically, if you wanted to play it over and over again, you'd probably eventually get bored of it because it only had a couple of levels, levels at launch. And obviously now this game has kind of more content in it, but it did start quite small. So something that, um, Fall Gaze have done to kind of capitalize on how big of a success sales-wise Fall Gaze was and to make sure that it's not going to be something that's kind of only popular for a couple of weeks and then um, becomes less and less popular with time. They've put a lot of effort and a lot of thought into creating and building communi a community around Fall Gaze. And the thing about Fall Gaze is that it was pretty big from, you know, from kind of like the release day, the community was pretty big. Um, in, a, in the first month after Fall Guys was released, you know, they've, re they've reached 1 million followers on Twitter, which is huge for a game. And they've had a Discord of a quarter million people, which is again, a huge community to moderate. Um, so what Mediatonic, which is an independent studio, well, they have been bought by Epic, I think last week, but at the time we're an independent studio, is they've basically figured out a way to keep people engaged and make sure that people liked Fall Guys so much that they would stay in kind of engaging with it. And whenever new content drops for the game, they're gonna be aware of the fact that that happened. But obviously Fall Guys kind of started big, right? And they've had a backing of a, of a company that was already established. So Paralives is another success story that I think is quite similar to how things went with Stardew Valley, which I'm sure that a lot of people know. Um, so Paralives was basically probably the first kind of um, the first competitor to the Sims series, really. Anyone who plays the Sims is probably aware of the fact that the community has not been very happy with how things were progressing between like, you know, from the jump between Sims 3 and Sims 4. So Paralives kind of grew from this momentum of Sims fans who wanted something more, who wanted to see a competitor to the game. So it began as a one person team, well, a one person project. Um, and the Paralives gained notoriety by the founder of uh, Paralives basically sending footage to creators and not even, not even a playable game. 
he would just send footage, just like a zip file of some screenshots and videos and people would play it on stream on YouTube and be like, oh my God, this is amazing. And Pyrolives has basically blossomed to a point where the community funds the game. So Pyrolives receives 28,000 pounds per month from Patreon. And that means that, first of all, the team was a bit, uh, you know, the team could grow. They were able to hire more people to actually build the game kind of faster. But at the same time, they don't need to worry about kind of shareholder imposed um, deadlines because it's up to them to figure out when they're happy with the game and when do they want to release it. So they've really kind of took a community and harnessed its power to the maximum. And the way they've, one of the kind of key things about Paralives is that they have involved and engaged their community from like the very beginning. Paralives have ensured that if they had any questions design-wise, that their community was basically the first people to, to be asked. They have taken feedback from the community into, you know, in the kind of placed it into the game so many times that this game is, in a big part kind of created and shaped by its community, which is an extremely effective way of building a community, this like mutually beneficial relationship and something that I will be talking in more detail um, later. Let me just check if there are any questions yet. No questions, moving on. Um, so how do you begin building a community? Obviously when you're kind of facing a, um, a Twitter account of zero followers and you just you just have a vague idea for a game, I understand that it might be probably quite tough to imagine what your next steps should be. So I am going to take you through a couple of things I would like you to consider when you're thinking about this. And then I'm gonna have, um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about platforms and then I'm gonna have a little task for, for all of you guys. I mean, you don't all have to do it. It would be nice if you did, but you know, it's okay. Um, so starting with an audience. So it is a bit, obviously, it's a kind of one of them like basic things in marketing is to look at your audience. But something that it's quite, that's quite new with kind of the era that we live in is that we have access to a lot of information and that includes information on audiences and analytics and all of that stuff. So that means that if you have a vague idea of who do you think would enjoy your game or could, could enjoy you as a creator or you know, your brand, um, you can compare that to you know, your competitors, like what well, other games they like or other creators they, they watch. And you can really try to figure out who your core audience is. Something to keep in mind is that we all probably carry a lot of misconceptions around who a gamer is. I've just recently read a study that said that I, I might misquote it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up later. But I believe that around something like around 35 to 40 percent of UK moms play games regularly, and it's not just mobile games because I know you you kind of expect that, but uh, a lot of them kind of move on to playing on PC and consoles. So um, 91 percent of Gen Zs play video games. That is basically it's a bigger cultural moment that uh, gaming sorry the music and film combined so gaming is huge and i don't want anyone to limit um their brand and themselves by thinking that you have to go for an audience that you would kind of think is like a traditional gaming audience because it is not the case anymore gaming audience is huge and incredibly diverse so basically don't fall into a trap of thinking that you have to go after a very specific type of people or very specific content creators it's it's not you don't have to limit yourself basically so when it's when looking at your audience um what you really want to see apart from because i'm not a huge fan of looking into stuff like age gender etc and trying to figure out who they are based on that because that really doesn't say anything to me what i would look at is what other games do they play or do you think they would play what sort of experience do they enjoy in their games or with their content creators what do they do in their free time so what sort of kind of hobbies do they have that isn't gaming and then yeah what content creators do they engage with and how often because people have different kind of they engage with games in a different way so do you think people that 
would be in your core audience or the sort of people who play games and talk about it a lot? Or do you think they, for example, watch a creator on Twitch and like are constantly in chat? Or are they people who just like lurk in the background or play games as a hobby, but don't really talk about it? And then, yeah, and how do they, do they, as your core audience, impact the buying choices of others? Because something that I want you to kind of think when you think about your core audience, this is kind of like your tightest knit group of people that you would kind of create a community with. So from, from that center, um, kind of the word around your game or your persona or your brand would kind of ripple and spread. So you want to figure out who are they and how do they engage with people and what can you do as a creator, or as a brand or as a game to convince them to, you know, message a friend and be like, wait, this is really cool. You should check it out. Um, and ways that you can kind of find out more about your audience. Um, I can share, I, I'm not sure, Amelia, I'm sorry to call you out like this, but I'm not sure if I can share, if there is a way for me to share the um, slides afterwards with someone, I can maybe put a link in the chat. Yeah, 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 yeah we can do that. <laughs> Sweet. Okay, so I'm not gonna stay on this bit too long. I'm just gonna share this whole um, thing later so you, can, you guys can have it. But the way you can find out more about your audience is there's a lot of websites that allow you to access some sort of um, data um, for free. It's not going to be extremely detailed. YouGov has a lot of blogs that are actually quite detailed. Statista, I think you only have like five things you can look at each month. There are articles in press that talk about um, different kind of analytics and of sources that wouldn't really be publicly available so that's good yuki which is the uk interact association for interactive entertainment um they release stats constantly they have a little wikipedia for for stats about gamers in the uk and beyond so that's always a great source and then facebook gaming does free reports um you, i think to access them you'd have to google facebook gaming business i think and yeah, and you can basically sign up and get free reports from them, I think, every month. And each month they kind of cover different audiences. So it's super helpful. And then other platforms, not only Facebook, also offer um, a lot of insights. So Twitch, I believe, does. And then Twitter does a lot. So you can kind of, depending on your platform, you can really kind of get insight on best practices from them and on best audiences. Um, and then the next thing, which I think is extremely important, is figuring out your resources. So if you're just a singular person or if you're a team of people, what you really want to ensure is that you don't spread yourself too thin because you will end up kind of not being satisfied with your results anywhere. I genuinely believe that it's so much better to only have presence on one platform if you believe that you can have enough kind of time and consistency to you have enough resources to go with that platform instead of trying to be present everywhere and not really kind of having your um heart fully in any of those platforms i will go through platforms in a second but um when it comes to your resources obviously time and consistency are the key things don't overwork yourself especially if you're you know one person team and you're you also have a game to make or content to create or any or you you work don't feel like you have to do everything do things bit by bit and then when you when you're able to expand but probably start with one thing so other resources that you might have that then could be shared for example would be in game assets so screen grabs videos and lore a lot of platforms have um, hashtags for um, creators and for um, game developers to show up their work, which are always a great way to get a lot of eyeballs on your game. Um, then also, if you have any sort of existing community, and that could also include, you know, your own personal followers or on any platform. Um, then obviously team members and their time and talent. If there is someone else who can help you or if there is a friend that you can involve, that would be, you know, that would be great because that takes a lot of pressure off you. And then physical products. So if you're working, for example, on starting up a tabletop game, or if you're working on a Kickstarter for one, and you were able to create a bunch of copies of physical products, that is 
one thing to do. Um, you can also create physical products inspired by the lore of your game. I actually, oh yes, there we go. That was, that was I didn't think I'm gonna show this, but I just remembered I had it. So Loading Bar in London, who some of you might know, it's I believe the first gaming bar in the UK. They have recently done a little game that's just printed like this. Um, and they've sent it to a bunch of their friends. And it is such a cost-effective and fun way to do something with your game um, that would then like allow you to send it out to, for example, content creators. So you can be very creative with, with how you do things. And then again, if you know any content creators, if you know, you know anyone, any press outlets specifically that you follow, if you follow any journalists and you're able to kind of relate to them, um, yeah on, on on any realm then that is also a great resource to have and then the last thing which is going to be a lot more marketing marketing -y, is tone of voice so i don't think you necessarily want to concern yourself too much with your tone of voice if you're like a one person team however if there's more of you or if you're planning to grow in the near future you should probably answer all of those questions so how do you speak as a brand? So not as yourself, but as your game or as, as a creator, because that's also a bit of a persona. How do you speak and how do you address fans? How informal are you? Because obviously if you're going to be targeting, let's say, you know, if you're doing a, an FPS or a game targeted at kids, you're going to be you know, talking, you're going to kind of use a different tone of voice than if you would, for example, be working on like an RTS. Um, and then how approachable are you? Can you take a joke? Can you kind of joke about your own brand and about your struggles as a game designer, for example? And then what's your brand persona and personality? Um, this is a cool thing to have because it seems gimmicky, but it's when you actually write down what sort of personality traits you'd want your game or your you as a creator or your brand to have, it is easier for you to then kind of always to keep consistent with the way you communicate. Um, so I'm going to move on to platforms in a second. But one thing I wanted to say is platforms have changed a lot in the past couple of years. Um, so you will notice that I did not put Instagram or Facebook there. So Facebook, I think that it's pretty self-explanatory. It is not easy to grow on Facebook anymore. A lot of people don't have Facebook, um, even though Facebook is pushing Facebook gaming quite rapidly, it is not it is not a platform where you can easily reach people who don't already follow you. So because Facebook has its algorithm geared towards kind of getting people to pay, um, you will struggle to kind of build any organic momentum there. And it is unfortunately starting to be the case for Instagram as well. I'm sure a lot of you have seen um, a, a few kind of um, updates that Instagram had recently with some of them, you know, adding reels, um, adding a shopping button. It looks like for all intents and purposes, Instagram might be thinking of moving to being a cross between a shopping platform and a social media network. So it is getting less and less relevant to games. And obviously, you know, within its design, you only really reach people that you um, that already follow you. You can't really go viral on Instagram the same way you can go viral on like TikTok or Twitter. So so yeah, so that's so that's basically my reasoning behind why I've chosen those four platforms. Um, so the first one is the probably the least resource heavy one, which is Twitter. So what's great about Twitter is that it doesn't have an algorithm based on what it thinks would be interesting to you, which Facebook and Instagram theoretically have. Um, so it will show you stuff as when it's posted. Um, that means that if someone follows you, they will probably see you. And also anyone can kind of like and retweet. And that means that they will see like, other people who don't follow you will see your content, which is great. And Twitter is very, it can be very casual while being retaining kind of the informative side of it. So that means that you can engage in casual conversations with fans without it being weird like it is on Facebook or extremely difficult. So 
it really allows you to kind of keep engaging with people who keep engaging with you and start kind of building a rapport with your fans, which is great. Um, so it is resource heavy if you want to do it right. But if you were to choose only one platform, then I would say Twitter is something where you can kind of update it from time to time and, you know, and and just and basically keep it keep it there but don't worry about it too much because um it is hard to build a community on twitter it is a very competitive space but at the same time you can get really lucky with twitter so if you feel like you're good at twitter and you understand it and you get the memes and you're able to kind of make jokes that people on twitter like it is something that could be could come really easily to you if you don't if you're not that familiar with twitter it might be a bit more resource heavy from you but it is probably i am going to say that it's probably the kind of least resource heavy out of all of them and that's probably because the rest are quite resource heavy um so twitch um which is great for creators if you are a brand the obviously the weird thing that you have to think about is that you need to people want to see faces you know if you stream without showing your face you don't really there's not a lot of creators who don't show their faces on twitch who you know have made it so if you want to stream you have to feel like you're up for it you're like you don't mind being on camera and you basically feel comfortable with that streamers to kind of make it on twitch you need a combination of like luck and consistency so a lot of creators who have kind of um get created like bigger communities on twitch they would have streamed for you know every day of the week for example which isn't great isn't very healthy can't be great for your mental health so it is something to kind of keep in mind that if you are for example um thinking of twitch being your main platform but you also have a lot of things going on you might want to wait until you have some more time and resources before you kind of like take it on however something that you can do to kind of get attention from people amongst you know a lot of game streams is you can do let's say if you're a developer you can do streams of you you know working on the dev work and then you can do dev q and a's you can show first builds you can Kind of grow a community through showing how you work as opposed to showing how your game works so obviously by all means stream your gameplay but in order to create a consistent calendar of stuff happening you will probably want to um focus on doing some doing a couple of things the, and i think that i personally am a huge fan of people who kind of stream um game making stuff or workshops or help people kind of um who are new to new to the scene or new to to that work so i think that is a great one um to do i know there's a thing on twitch i'm sorry i'm gonna go on a tangent but i know there is a thing on twitch where people like stream themselves working for eight hours and everyone in the chat is also working and they like use this to motivate themselves i've seen a couple of those streams so you know maybe that's something that you can consider as well there's a lot of ways to kind of go about creating interesting and um kind of cutting edge content on twitch or like something at least something slightly different um and then we have discord so Discord is interesting because it's not something that you would necessarily kind of, um, it's not something where that's kind of a good starting platform, I would say. It's not publicly visible. So you have to actually go through um, the step of like joining Discord to be able to participate. But it does create kind of a communal atmosphere. You can create channels, you can talk to people privately. Um, and it's really good to kind of keep your community engaged. So the way, the best way to use Discord is first of all, content creators um, use Discord to keep in touch with their community, to update them on what they're doing, to ask their opinions on um, what sorts of content should they create. Um, they basically kind of make the Discord community feel like a part of the process. And it's the same for, game um discord so a lot of like pre-release games game discords are great because you can really kind of get your community involved and ask them a bunch of questions like paralives do 
But the, the downside of Discord is obviously, well, first of all, you probably need to have a following on some other platform to kind of be able to populate your Discord. And second of all, it requires a lot of work to kind of keep engagement up and to also keep the Discord nice and safe and clean. So you need probably at some point you did need moderators or if you're doing it yourself, then it's probably going to take a while for you to kind of read every message and make sure that everything's fine. So it is something that's really good for larger teams or for a creator who can kind of rely on volunteer moderators. But it is it is a very specific tool that is going to be great for some people and just not right for others. And the last one, um, TikTok, of course. So I know that a lot of people still consider it to be either a niche or new platform, but it's not really any of those. But what it is, is extremely good for reaching new uh, communities. So it's very efficient because you on TikTok, if you post something, you will see if, even if you have zero followers, you get like, let's say 150 views. Those 150 views come from the algorithm pushing your content onto people that it thinks might like your stuff. And depending on how long they watch it, how many times do they watch it? Um, what are they looking at? What are they doing? Are they commenting or sharing? It will either show your content to more people or kind of let it fizzle away. So especially initially on TikTok, your followers don't really matter that much, except for kind of giving TikTok um, an idea that you might be a good content creator, so creator who creates good content consistently, because you will still constantly reach new audiences, um, which is very different to any of those other platforms. This, this platform is truly the best for people who um, are planning to, are completely new, and then are thinking about how to reach a lot of people and get the word out there um, when you haven't, you, when you don't have any resources in terms of like existing community, for example. So um, of course, you know, the downside of it is that you have to be good at TikTok and you have to understand TikTok quite well and what works on TikTok to be able to build that community. And then um, you, ca you have to probably show your face as well. Though the good thing about TikTok is that if you are sh kind of creating TikTok videos, they can be like super high effort and people are going to be like, wow, like this looks amazing. I love it. Or they can be low effort, but funny. And then everyone's also going to love it. So you can really kind of basically choose your path and either go like super low fire or like super high quality. And you will probably be able to find success both those of those ways. Gaming content on TikTok specifically is a bit different than what it is on other platforms because it's not much about like clips from the game, more about how does this game make you feel? What are like the relatable things you feel while, while playing a game? Or maybe you can make TikToks about what it's like trying to promote or create your own game. So you can really kind of think about more like emotive stuff as opposed to just kind of showing off the visuals of your game, for example. Um, so I am going to go on to the task. So I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes. Uh, Amelia, I hope that's, I hope that's okay. I'm so, again, sorry yeah, for like, totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes. Um, and the task is to describe your core audience and your current resources. And based on that, which platform would you focus on? Um, you don't, if you don't have a project right now, Imagine yourself as a content creator or think about the dream game that you'd like to do, or even think about a game that's out and you're playing and how you'd kind of go about it if you were just about to make it. Um, I am putting my email on there because if you want to email this to me, that would be great. And I can give you feedback later. You can put it in chat as well, if that's something you'd like to do. And I can have a look at some of your um, resources, but yeah, feel free to kind of come up with stuff and put it in chat or send it over to me. It would be good to discuss some of your stuff and I can tell you what I think and if I have any, any advice. So, but again, if you don't wanna, if, if you're feeling shy, then that's cool. They can just email it to me and I will um, get back to you in five working days, <laughs> I'm gonna say. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute myself and disappear and I'm gonna give you guys 10 minutes and I will be back 
um, let's say, I'm <clears throat> sorry, at like 4.48, which is extremely specific. <laughs>
right, and we're back. Yes, thank you so much, Amelia. So, Louise, thank you so much for sending this through. I also got a couple of emails, but I'm going to assume that if you are sending me an email, you're a bit shy and you want me to just reply to you privately, which I will. Um, and if you haven't managed to send me an email yet, you know, go ahead. It's it's not the end of the world. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much. So, Louise, you've said that you're thinking about making a game about sweet stuff for young people. I can send you a couple of games that I think you might want to kind of have a look at and see how they have done their marketing. Obviously, you'd want to kind of have a unique angle with this. Um, a game called, wait, um, it's, I don't want to, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing it right, so I'm just going to put it in the chat, um, has a really unique approach to kind of making a game about all things sweet and interesting and small and weird. Um, and you can look at how they kind of like went about marketing the game. I think that um, TikTok is a great um, way to go about, you know, going with a game like that. I think Twitch is always a good option. Um, I would probably say focus on TikTok. And I know you've said that you'd probably want to do Instagram, which is cool if you already have an existing audience on Instagram. I understand that. But I think that if you're basically standing between a choice of um, making content for TikTok versus making content for Instagram, make it on TikTok and then just put it on Reels on Instagram and you kind of, you know, two birds, one stone. Um, so I am going to go back to my slides and now kind of onto the like super exciting part, which is how to create content. So I am not going to be too kind of thorough and restrictive on this because I think the best way to create content is to create content that's unique. Um, so that is not something that's something that's gonna come from like how unique you your brand is and like your ideas are as opposed to what I could potentially teach you. However, I also think that sometimes um, it, it, you can have a unique idea sometimes and that's gonna help you go viral and build a community and that's great or not even go viral, but reach more people. But um, what's important when it comes to kind of building communities is consistency. So you'd probably want to look into how you can combine, you know, great ideas and crazy stuff with just kind of the everyday building and engaging with your community. So starting with Twitter, um, of course, the first thing you'd really want to do is engage with popular accounts within like kind of your genre of gaming or the sort of people that your audience follows. Um, and you can do it through, it, there's multiple ways you can really go about it. You can reply to their tweets or quote tweet them and kind of try to build engagement that way. That will really work if they're a smaller creator because for someone bigger who gets, you know, hundreds or thousands of replies to every tweet, it's probably not going to be um, that effective. Having said that, it's probably better to start with someone smaller anyway, as you're smaller and then kind of move on to engaging with bigger creators. But something you can do is, if there is a small creator or like a medium-sized creator who you think is great and you're like, oh my God, how can I get them to talk about my game? Um, what you can do is, for example, ask them if they'd like to be an NPC in your game. A lot of people would love to be an NPC in a game, including me, if anyone's making any games. So that is something that you can offer to a content creator and they might say, oh my God, yes, that's a great idea. I'd love to do that. Um, you can perhaps ask them for their input as someone whose opinion you trust. Just kind of don't come too strong on them. Don't try to kind of get... You know, don't get frustrated if they don't reply or get overwhelmed by messages and stuff like that. They are very busy people probably, so don't take it personally. It's good to have a couple of creators you're looking at on Twitter to make sure that you're not kind of putting all their eggs in one basket. And then, as I, I've mentioned before, that on Twitter you often get kind of um, hashtag challenges um, that go for the wider gaming community. So you want to maybe follow some organizations without, within gaming, and I think Yuki is a good one, um, and look at the sort of stuff they're tweeting about and engaging with, and you're maybe, you know, maybe going to get um, 
to find a hashtag that's like perfect for your game. Recently, there was one that which I obviously forgotten, but I don't know, remember what it was. But what I remember is that people were sharing really vibrant. Oh, I think it was hashtag the art of vibrancy. Uh, people were sharing basically like really vibrant um, bits from their games, screen grabs and videos and stuff like that. I think that one of um, yeah, like game accounts they've seen got like 250,000 likes out of that hashtag so you know it's it's a thing um and then yeah utilize screen grabs videos and lore from your game depending on who you're after if you're after like a tabletop community they obviously love lore so you can figure out the best way to kind of tease lore and talk about lore in a way that's gonna leave them kind of always wanting more and then memes of course which is what, what twitter is for um but be mindful of coming off as someone who tries very hard. You know how sometimes brand accounts like try really hard to be relatable and just end up kind of missing the the, the spot. Just try to kind of if you if you feel like you're good at kind of posting like Twitter memes and I, you think that you're able to kind of translate it well to talking as a brand or as a game, that's cool but don't kind of force it if you don't feel like it's your strong suit. Not every single game Twitter needs to have memes. Not every single Twitter needs to have memes. People follow those accounts for different reasons. So that is something to keep in mind. And then moving on to Twitch, of course, what you wanna wanna what kind of you're gonna want to do is live streams. Um, nothing else really to do on Twitch. But what you can um, kind of decide is, do you wanna maybe build yourself as a creator who also works on a game or just a creator or if you want to kind of stream as a game account so get a team of people to stream from like one account so you can really kind of figure out how you want to go about it you probably want to make sure that every single stream you do especially if you're trying to kind of come across as a brand or a game um that they all look sleek and nice that you have a nice kind of visual style, that your that everything kind of works well, that you have a couple of screens for like technical difficulties and stuff like that um, for stream starting soon. So your community can kind of start gathering before you show your face. Um, so yeah, so that's that's a couple of things that you need to think about. And then try to be unique. I, I kind of touched upon that a lot um, just before we went on the break. But instead of kind of just streaming your game over and over and over again, you can really do a lot of stuff that people don't do that much on Twitch, but are interesting. I think that every single person who plays video games or watches Twitch content um, probably asks themselves a question on like, how do they make them? Like how do 3D models get built? Or how do people make pixel art? Or like, how do, how do like, how, does the process of creating game or even writing dialogue um, work? So if that's something that you're able to talk about and show off, um, that is something that would go quite well on, on Twitch. You also want to think about, um, can you partner up with other creators? Um, are there any opportunities for streamers that you can kind of think of if you're a, at a university or a school or, you know, involved in any organizations, can you do maybe a charity live stream and, you know, get some extra support from your school or university and get some extra kind of viewership there. So there is a lot to kind of consider, but um, Twitch is yeah as i said before twitch is all about kind of consistency so if you are kind of deciding to go with twitch think about what can you do and think about if you can be consistent with it because even if you build a community and kind of leave them for a couple of weeks or months they might not be there when you come back which is sad but unfortunately it's the reality um so yeah so sorry about the sad note but moving on to discord and tiktok so discord is obviously great for exclusive content so it's kind of like patreon but free so just as a reward for signing up 
to, the, to a Discord server and to as a reward to kind of being present and engaging with others and talking about the game and helping out with the game, you get access to exclusive content. So it could be sneak peeks, it could be surveys that you kind of ask people like, what do you want to see? What, what's your feedback on this? Would you like me to change that? And then again, unreleased lore, concept art is great. Um, you can get your community involved in the process of creating and updating your game. So even if your game is out, you can kind of ask people what do they want to see. So obviously not a small not a small studio by any means, but EA has started doing this recently where they basically ask their community um, to vote on whatever they want to see next and then make it into a game park. So you can really kind of involve your community on any levels, but obviously the smaller your community, the more kind of closely knit it's going to be. And then what you can do is you can reward people in, um, you know, in many different ways, which is really cool. You can reward them with game codes once your game is out. You can reward them with Discord titles. Um, you can reward them with product send outs if you're creating physical products or even, you know, immortalize them in a, ga in a game. As I was saying that you can ask a creator if they want to be an NPC in your game, you can do the same to um, your fans. One game that did it was Pillars of Eternity. So Pillars of Eternity uh, released in, I believe, 2015, and they were entirely funded by Kickstarter and all of the like larger Kickstarter backers um, would kind of show up in, in the game as like NPCs. So like as just people in cities. So the game would basically have like crowds of people and you can come up to them and they have a name picked by a Kickstarter backer and they would have like a little bit of a background on them, which is quite nice and a really good way to kind of really reward people for helping a game, you know, be made. And then TikTok. So what you really want to do is, unfortunately, you have to be on TikTok quite a lot to kind of catch up on all the newest trends, which is cool. I already am on TikTok a lot, so, you know, it works for me. But you basically want to kind of participate in new hashtag challenges and use trending sounds, um, but keep them relevant to your audience. So as you probably, if you're on TikTok, you probably know that um, we all see different sides of TikTok depending on our interests and what would work for one side of TikTok and what's a trending sound in one side of TikTok, you might not even hear it at all. So you really want to figure out what's trending amongst people you want to reach and then kind of keep keep creating content that relates to that. And then, yeah, you, that basically means that you have to kind of find your niche on TikTok and kind of commit to it. And one way you can ensure that your content is being seen by them is by identifying TikTok creators who you think are perfect for you and basically working and collaborating with them. Uh, TikTok creators, from my experience, are super cool and super nice and really approachable. And if you're if you're a small creator or if you're making a game, honestly, don't feel like you have to be, you know, you have to be stressed about reaching out to someone. Go ahead, they're all really nice. Um, so yeah, so those are kind of the ways that you can create content. I didn't um, cover YouTube and I didn't cover any like long form video content because I believe that creating long form video content for small, um, for small indie developers is quite, a, it's quite a bit of work. So these are, these are platforms where you can kind of you know, you don't have to spend as much time. And even if you don't have a lot of resources available to you, you're, you'll be able to kind of work with each one of those platforms. But when it comes to kind of creating consistent long form content, which, you know, involves editing and stuff like that, it is something that's a bit more difficult. Of course, for anyone who wants to be a YouTube content creator, it is something that, um, you would be most interested in kind of like hearing about. But what I would say is for creating YouTube content, again, as with TikTok and as with Twitter, you're going to have a constant kind of wave of trends. So there are two things that I would say. First of all, keep in line with whatever YouTube is telling people to do. So as you probably know, YouTube has had this, like a sweet spot of video length, which was like three minutes, I think like 10 years ago. And then they moved it to a video needs to be over 10 minutes. So things have changed quite rapidly and a lot of creators were left out because of that, which is not great. So you wanna make sure that you keep up to date with all the messaging that 
YouTube kind of sends out to its creators and you make sure that what you do is something that YouTube algorithm likes. And yeah, and YouTube also has kind of seasonal trends um, amongst gaming creators, you know, working with um, games that are just releasing or a good way to do it is kind of try to look at new trend, new and trending tab on Steam. And this only really applies to anyone who would like to be a content creator. But if you look at the new and trending um, or like upcoming trending releases on Steam, you can find games that people are going to be uh, interested about hearing a review and play it really early and create a video really early and get a review out and or like gameplay footage and therefore you might be able to kind of get some viewership through that but um moving on to engagement and retention so you basically are going to kind of reaching a community and starting a community and creating a community is one side of the coin. Another is that because you're probably not going to have like a constant never ending stream of funds, so you wouldn't have to care if like someone's not engaged with you anymore, you're going to have to figure out a way to get your fans involved. So I touched on it when I was discussing Discord because it's a really good platform to do it. But that basically means that um, you wanna, you want to, um, th there's a marketing team, sorry, the marketing term called retention, which basically means that you retain your community, they stay engaged. The opposite of that is churn, which is a term used to describe anyone, like any brand that acquires and quickly loses its users or fans. So you want to keep your fans engaged and you want to make sure that if someone's engaging with your content or talking to you or is in your Discord chat or is in your Twitch chat, that they feel appreciated. So you probably have seen Twitch creators shouting out people when they subscribe or follow. That is one way to get engagement and retention and make sure that people feel like, oh, amazing, someone like someone said you know my my arrival in this community has been noticed um and that's something that you can also do on discord and you can basically think about kind of what would you like if you were a member of a community what would you like the kind of leader of the community to do to make you feel welcome and what would make you leave so you basically want to avoid doing anything that could alienate your friend your fans and then think about how you can kind of engage with people who like engaging with you. So one way you can do it is obviously keep them involved and tell them what's happening. So if you are working on a game, kind of keep telling them, you know, what you're up to, even if you don't have a visual update that you can send them, you can tell them, oh, you know, today I've made good progress on this and that. So, you know, soon I should be able to share something with you. And then if they have any suggestions, listen to them, because I think that, um, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to start building a community and thinking, okay, cool, I'm going to ask people their suggestions, but not, re not really treat it as seriously. Kind of, if you have a really strong creative vision and you don't want people to tell you what your game could look like or how to improve your game, don't promise that to people because they will quickly catch on the fact that they're not being listened to and you're going to lose some funds over that. Uh, another thing is to obviously engage with them. So if you have your community talking to Discord, you know, on Discord, you know, jump in, have a chat with them. And then community leaders are basically, it's basically someone who kind of engages with you a lot and talks to you a lot um, and reward them like on Discord, for example, or anywhere else, give them free game codes, drop, drop them a message and be like, hey, I really appreciate how like much love and support are you showing to my game? Just basically think about how can you make sure that everyone feels really welcome? And another kind of part of that is also making sure that if you are running a larger community, that moderation is really on point. So you don't wanna kind of let people into your community that make others feel unwelcome. And sometimes it's a really tough choice um, if you feel like you know one of the founding members of your community is not being great towards others, but if someone's not behaving well and if someone's making people in your community feel unwelcome, it is definitely time for you to intervene. So keep in mind that as a part of like engagement and retention, there's also, you know, there's also a moment when you have to kind of be like, okay, if someone's not behaving well, then I should probably let them go. And on Twitter, that means you can block them or you can just stop 
engaging and interacting with them on Discord, just remove them from the server, block them on Twitter or TikTok, etc. So that is something to kind of keep in mind in terms of moderation. And then working with creators. So of course, if you're starting from scratch, um, what you really wanna kind of want to do is get noticed by someone. So I have prepared a little list of people who, of kind of ways that you can engage with creators ac across um, all platforms apart from Discord, of course. So again, really make sure that you're going after creators who are highly relevant to you or your game, because um, if you're going to try to go after a lot of creators and some of them are not really gonna be a good fit, you're just gonna get frustrated and you're gonna spend a lot of time and effort on something that's not really going to work. So really kind of go after creators who you feel like super relevant and then start with small creators and then work your way up. So, you know, start with someone who has a couple of thousand followers and then kind of move on as, as you kind of grow together, move up to bigger creators um, and try to get their attention. And then um, it's really important to be super polite to creators because they keep seeing creators kind of post emails from independent game devs or from fans who are kind of um, not being very polite to them or kind of demanding stuff of them it is you know it's it's a big favor they would do for you if they spend time reviewing or working on your game or talking about it or helping you in any any way so if they say they're not interested you know just just you know cut your losses and move on and look into other creators um it's good to be concise because creators get a lot of emails and dms um you really want to kind of use their business email first and then then their dms because that's probably what they're going to be checking more um and yeah just include something relevant when you're messaging a creator for the first time you can say that you're a fan or you can say that i know that you like this game and i think mine is quite similar or be like i really respect your opinion and i think you know you're a very valuable member of the gaming community and I would love to, you know, have you try my game. So basically be super, super polite because they would do you a massive favor if they did kind of want to cover your game. And then some other ways that you can kind of go about reaching creators is that if your game features any physical product, you can create small press kits to send to their uh, PO address. So it is, if you're, it's it's great for like tabletop um, games, but if you don't have any sort of physical product, I've shown you the kind of mini card games that um, Loading Bar has created. There's a lot of websites in the UK or like company, companies in the UK that do stuff from like biscuits to, you know, other like kind of branded stuff. So maybe you perhaps want to kind of send a little box to a creator to be like, hey, you know, check me out. I hope you like what I've come, come up with. Or you can, for example, send them stuff that no one else has seen. So that's the kind of approach that Paralyze have done, that they've sent um, people videos and screenshots of stuff that no one else has seen before. But also you can do that physically. So you can send them snippets of lore that you print on like cool parchment paper or whatever, and then um, send that to people and get them to kind of you know, be like, oh my God, this is, I'm like the only person who has this, should, I should probably tweet about it. So this person, like this game's fans can also know that this is happening. And then another thing um, that I'm not gonna go into that much because it obviously requires a budget is sponsored streams and videos. You can reach out to creators and ask for their rates, but um, especially when going after smaller creators or TikTok creators, some of them would um, agree to really, really low rates. And I am going to say that you should probably wait until you can pay people a little bit more because content creators really need to kind of be paid fairly for their work. You really don't want to kind of underpay someone because that could create a lot of bad blood in front, you know, in your relationship in the future. So if you are, if you're thinking about, you know, a content creator and you're wondering what to go to them with, you can drop me an email and I can kind of help you figure out what could be potentially a good rate for that person. But don't like approach anyone and offer like 10 or 15 pounds, which I've seen people do, by the way, I'm not just saying this to say it. 
Um, so yeah, so that's one of the kind of main considerations that content creators are, you know, this is their main source of income for a lot of them. And you really want to kind of show that you respect their time. Um, yeah, I just, I'm not sure, Amelia, because I have one more task, but I am not sure if I should do a little Q&A now, if anyone has any questions, or should I go on to the task? Yeah, it looks like we've got a question in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to do that. And if anyone else has any other questions, if you, if, even if it's very specific to kind of your game or what you're working on, just feel free to drop on uh, in the chat. So from Ethan, uh, when it comes to creating a successful IP, is it good to balance ideas that you think they would like with ideas that they might never seen before? Um, I think a lot of successful IPs I've seen recently are quite novel. I think that you have to kind of remember that um, I, I think a balance is right. It's difficult to strike, but you really kind of want to make sure that there is some sort of familiarity. So you basically want to make sure that people can relate your game or whatever you're creating to something they've seen or engaged with in the past, because it's going to be easier to convince them to try whatever you're making. If you can be like, oh, this is a little bit like this, or this is the genre that this is, that this is in. However, I have seen a lot of really kind of unique IPs, um, especially in the tabletop space kind of popping up recently. So I'm going to say, don't feel like you have to um, kind of tone down your ideas because there is a lot of successful games that have released re recently that are you know successful because they're so unique or they have a completely kind of new version of an idea that's familiar to people. So I would say like Among Us, for example, is a good example of that where you have um, you know, a, a party game that everyone played, but in like a, such a kind of, t with like such a twist on it that makes it really, really unique and fun. And Valheim is another game that released recently that also has a lot of kind of um, elements that are very familiar, but also really well done and a lot of unique ideas. So I would say um, don't feel constrained by what you think people might like because you might be surprised uh, kind of what, how people would react to your game. And I'm gonna, so maybe I should go to the next task. Again, I'm, I'm really, I'm sorry, I'll keep like. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, of course, go straight to your next task. Sweet, so this is something that I would, I basically would like to kind of offer um, anyone watching that if you want to create a content plan for your chosen platform or creators that you want to work with or if you're working on an IP or a game or anything and you're wondering am I if I take this approach with my marketing is it going to work um, please feel free to drop me an email and I can basically reply to you and tell you what I think would work. I can suggest some creators, I can suggest some platforms or kind of the sort of content that you can create. So yeah, that would basically any questions or any kind of content ideas or anything that you might want to run past me, I am happy to take a look at. And here is my um, last slide, which says exactly what I've just said, <laughs> but in a slide form. I'm gonna stop now and yeah, if I'm I'm not sure there are any more questions, but if anyone has any questions, you know, now's the time or you can drop me an email. And if not, then Amelia, I'm gonna go over to you. Brilliant, thank you. Um what what is a content plan? What does it usually look like? So a content plan would be um I would simplify it really for the purposes of this. So I would say if you're thinking about Twitch, you can send me, okay, so like on Mondays, I'd like to stream that sort of stuff. And on Tuesdays, I'd like to stream that. Or you can look at Twitter and be like, so on Twitter, I'd mostly like to um, quote tweet creators and then like post lore snippets or post videos of, of, of my game or anything like that. And you can basically just send like a very loose plan of how you would see you know, yourself posting content on any of your chosen platforms and I can help you out and tell you, yes, I think this is great or maybe you can do this or maybe you can also add this or maybe it's better if you do it, you know, from time to time and then focus on this 
So yeah, basically I'm happy to kind of give you feedback or on anything you think would go into your marketing strategy. Sounds great. And I guess it's really important to be realistic about what you can actually deliver as well. Um, when you're making your content plan, it's good to probably have a different type of content being delivered every day, but is it realistic that you can keep that up, I guess? Yeah, so it's something that I think I see a lot of people struggle with in the kind of indie scene. And I would say focus on your strengths always. So don't feel like you have to do so many things at once because it's you don't have to put pressure on yourself. There, like the external world is going to put enough pressure on you. You don't have to be another kind of element of like yourself putting pressure on yourself. So um, I would say honestly, be super honest with yourself and think about what do you think is feasible with all the stuff that you have going on in your life and like you know your mental capacity at the end of the day what can you really do and kind of deliver yeah for sure i think as well um i've spoken to students in the past and and looked at kind of social media accounts as well um that are i think you mentioned polished earlier, getting good quality content out there. Um, I'm just wondering if you had any tips for our students who might want to get into content creation or um, promoting their indie development or even themselves as a freelancer um, online using these platforms. Is there any kind of, I guess, startup equipment or, or um, you know, here I've got quite a fancy setup behind me. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, I definitely don't have this at home. Um, and I know a lot of teachers lately having to move practice online have had to get all sorts of bits and bobs like ring lights and webcams and stuff that we didn't have to get before um, that have helped kind of make our uh, content online more slick, more professional, I guess. So is there anything that you'd kind of recommend to a startup um, might improve how, how good their content's looking online? Yes, so the good thing is because there's a lot of um, kind of new HD cameras and new kind of equipment, it's not very expensive. It's not, you know, nearly as expensive as it used to be. The bad thing is because of the pandemic and everyone being at home, actually a lot of kind of good camera equipment and I love even beginner camera equipment is sold out everywhere. So that is something that they're going to have to live with. But um, ring lights are always very cheap. I've seen ring lights that cost, you know, five or 10 pounds and it's, it's just light. It doesn't need to be expensive, especially when you're just starting out. I would say more, because I think that, you know, we all have, probably we all have um, phones that and a lot of our phones have good cameras and a lot of people don't know but you can stream from twitch for twitch or from your phone for example so including camera so that is something to kind of consider that you can use your phone as your camera and you don't necessarily need to kind of buy additional equipment but i'm also going to say that if you have a friend or if you're able to do nice designs yourself um, it's a good idea to think about kind of including nice stream assets and um, perhaps, yeah, like new uh, nice banner for your Twitter profile or some custom emotes for your Discord. It's always nice to kind of have some personal touches. I'm going to put down a website in the chat, which is, um, uh, it's called Creative Market. And it's, you can basically, for like 10 or $15, you can buy stream overlays and customize them, which is really good. Um, and yeah, there's one question in the chat that I might answer now. So um, can laws, at times, can laws to do with copyright heavily restrict content such as YouTube clips, parodies, and fun animations? So it depends. It's, it's, a, it's a very wide question because you basically have to realize that if you are a brand, you can't do stuff that you could do as just yourself as a person. So whatever you do, however you use or reuse someone else's content, you're, you're reusing it for commercial purposes. So that restricts you in kind of what you can do. So if you're a content creator, you don't really have to worry about stuff like this too much because the worst thing that would happen to you is YouTube, for example, taking your video down. But if you're a brand, especially a bigger brand, using stuff that doesn't belong to you or that you don't have rights for or that you haven't licensed, that could 
um, you know, that, that could pose some issues for you. When it comes to parodies, every single country has different laws for parodies. But even if you um, are in line with, well, for example, the United States considers a parody because that's the country that the laws of like YouTube is governed by the laws of the United States. Um, that still doesn't mean that your video is not going to get blocked or that's not going to be removed because unfortunately, you know, YouTube is a private company that gets to do whatever they want really. And it's up to them to interpret how, what their T's and C's mean. So like terms and conditions, what do they mean? So they can, in their terms and conditions, they're going to say that, you know, ultimately the decision on content or if it counts as a parody or if it is copyrighted or not, is going to um, be up to YouTube. And if I'm sure that a lot of you have heard about um, which having to remove a lot of content from the site because people would use copyrighted music and then there was a, you know, and they suddenly, in order to not get sued, Twitch would have to be very kind of <clears throat> vigilant about removing this content as soon as it pops up. So you have to be unfortunately very, um, you basically nothing, it, it's hard to, ex to kind of answer this question because you could literally make parodies for years and nothing's going to happen to you, or you can use like, uh, unlicensed piece of video once and your video is going to be taken down. So it is, it's very much like luck as well involved in it. So I don't know if that answered your question. But it's, I did a, yeah. it's a difficult one that because intellectual property laws exist, like you mentioned, differently in different um, territories. It doesn't necessarily mean that the creator or holder of that IP is going to yeah. ask you to take it down or, you know, take advantage of the rights that they have, but they could at any point. So I guess yeah. it's good to keep that in mind. And that means that if someone else holds copyright and you, for example, your content on YouTube is monetized and someone else holds copyright to one clip, um, they can monetize your whole video and put ads every like 15 seconds if they want. And suddenly all the money you make goes to them. There was a creator who have, has licensed um, a video from like a stock video site, um, and put it in his YouTube video and got copyright claimed by that licensing site, even though he paid for like a commercial license. So it's honestly this copyright system on YouTube and other platforms is a bit of a mess now. I think that laws of uh, in a lot of places have not really caught up with how quickly the internet has moved on. And it shows basically in all of, all of those platforms. I can see another question, which is, I'm part of a group of people who have started an indie company and we're working on a first game right now. What would be the ideal time to start building an audience? Would you recommend waiting until we have something, some solid content? So I would say settle on a name, probably, because that's going to save you a lot of pain and misery later on if you ever want to change the name of it. Um, and then other than that, you would probably want to have a solid idea that you all agree on on what the game is like how does it look what's the story of it how do you play it who is it for so i don't think you need to have like a million like great looking assets to start building a community but i think you have to have like the basics of it that so you have to be very certain about what you're going to call it who's it going to be for what sort of a game or genre it's going to be um, what sort of people you believe would be into it because you want to build a community. You don't want to accidentally build a community that isn't going to end up like interested in your game because that would be not great. So you'd really want to make sure that before you kind of start doing that, you have an idea on like, who do you want to target? Um, but then again, when it, you don't honestly have to kind of limit yourself by, oh my God, do I have to have like a lot of assets and stuff to share? People like to, we kind of follow games and see them grow and kind of develop right in front of their eyes. So don't, you don't think that you have to kind of come to the internet of anything polished. Not at all. It's it's totally fine. Just be sure of the concept. That's what, that's what I would say. And I'm checking. Oh yeah, there's one more um, from Ethan. This might sound a bit specific, but is Nintendo affecting their online momentum with their copyright? and how that affects Nintendo, let's players or not, or is that not a problem anymore? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't read. But anyway, it's a good, it's a good one because um, 
Nintendo has always had a very specific kind of approach to copyright. Like it's a bit of a kind of running joke that like if you mention Nintendo in a, anywhere that you're gonna get a cease and desist letter from them. And I think that because it's a specific game and they have a very strong grip on a part of an audience and market and everyone loves them no matter what they do, um, it, Nintendo's gonna be fine. It's not going to affect fans, but um, people are moving like companies are moving away from this like nintendo style kind of copyright anyway because if you look at um i remember that cd project a uh, game company that no one likes anymore uh when they when witcher 3 released they basically put out a statement that said please feel free to make art of our game make feel free to stream it like make videos about it we want our we want the community to get involved with, with this game and if you are let's say in the future working in like a marketing role at a company, it is something to think about to kind of, how can you signal to your fans that it's cool for them to kind of reuse and repurpose your game and make modes for it and, you know, play around with it and make art about it. But um, Nintendo doesn't mind a lot of things. It's, it's funny because like, if you go on Etsy and type in Nintendo, you're going to find like a million of like bootleg Nintendo products that Nintendo had nothing to, to do with, but they are sometimes quite strict uh, with other stuff. So again, sorry, all the copyright questions are just really difficult because nothing is set in stone. Basically, like theoretically it is, but a lot of companies just choose to not pursue some stuff that happens online to their games. So, um, yeah, I would say if you are asking, for example, because you want to do reviews or because you want to create content around games, you're completely fine to do that. That is protected in by like both T's and C's. And I think like it's protected in American law. You can review, use reuse footage to review and no company ever is going to be mad at you for using their footage. Um, even if you're being negative about the game because you are providing them publicity. So don't feel like that could stop you from becoming a content creator, for example, because that is something that you're going to have to worry about when you're like a huge content creator. So you're good for now and then you'll probably worry about it. Yeah, we cover um, copyright law and intellectual property law in the, the second year of the games course quite intensively um, so you've got that to look forward to Ethan <laughs> um, fantastic have we got any more questions at all no I think we covered them all I think we're good yeah we've had quite a few haven't we I think it's worth mentioning as well um, that MJ and I met through a network on Facebook um, and LinkedIn called women in games the Women in Games Network, and we're both ambassadors for that as well. So, you know, it works both professionally and in terms of, um, you know, developing your brand as well. Um, and I'm really glad that we got in touch through that. Yeah, me too. And I think that's something to kind of think about is that if you are an indie developer, if you're just starting out, you're not alone by any means. There is other people in your situation that are also struggling to kind of get their game out or get started as a content creator. And there's a lot of places that you can kind of look for support. So don't ever feel like, you know, if you feel overwhelmed or whatever, there are groups of people there who can tell you, don't worry, you're, you're not alone. Like it happens to us that we feel like this sometimes too. So I would say probably one of the first things that you should do is to, should have probably put it in my presentation. But um, you should you should join a group of people who are also marketing their games or are also, you know, of disadvantaged background in games or are making games or whatever. Just kind of build a community, not only of like fans, but also of people who have the same struggles as you. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a really good, um, positive bit of advice to end on there as well, MJ. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and experience. Um, and yeah, we'll be, be in touch still on uh, the Women in Games Network. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Cheers, everyone.